Well, good morning, Bethel Church. Good to uh, be with you. I want to welcome, of course, everyone here, uh, those joining us in the chapel, and then, of course, if you're joining us from your phone or TV or wherever else you're at, welcome. Uh, it is Gifts Thanks Sunday. He gets it. He gets it. Uh, it's a day where we can remind ourselves, regardless of what the craziness in our world might look like, there are so many reasons we can be thankful. And it's actually almost like a slap in the face, a repositioning of ourselves to say, God, maybe we've been focusing on the wrong things here. Let's bring us back to being thankful for everything you're doing. And I have to tell you, nobody does that better than Bethel kids. The uh, Bethel kids have written down, I have 10, 10 awesome reminders. These were things I didn't even know we should be thankful for. And uh, so we're going to read them out. We have Audrey, <laughs> age five. <laughs> She's thankful for her nails, which I admit, I don't do a lot with mine, but if I didn't have them, that would be weird. So thank you, Audrey, for that great reminder. Uh, Zebediah, <laughs> he's, yes, he's thankful for dinosaurs. And I'm not quite sure I see it in the picture, but it's very abstract, which is good. Uh, Asher, age five, says, God making the world. And you can kind of see it, God doing his thing. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, Ari, age three, thankful for rainbows, right? Love that. Uh, Aislinn, who's one of our uh, sixth graders, she, she wrote quite a list. She's thankful for music and worship, family, pets, school, sports, the church, and Jesus. Friends, scientists, farmers, Jesus' prophets, which uh, I don't think it's talking about his money, though it is spelled that way, uh, and Jesus' disciples. Uh, I'm thankful for all that. Azalea, uh, one of our first graders, says she's thankful for her mom and her dad. And if your kids go to Bethel, kids, and you were afraid they might not have written that, a lot of kids wrote that answer. I just chose one that says that. But that was the most popular answer. So good job, parents. Uh, this person remains anonymous. They wrote food and water and Christmas. And then there's Jesus, my home, food and Christmas again. But if you look closely, you will see the lamp from a Christmas story. The leg and all... They thought they'd sneak that one by. And then Maverick, age three, he doesn't even know what he's thankful for, but it's a lot. There is all sorts of great stuff going there. Ashton, pick roll, age 12, uh, he almost writes a poem here. He says, a roof over my head, a toasty bed. I'd really dread to lose these things. I'm thankful for smoothies, movies, friends and family. All these things are given to me. I'd be bored if it weren't for the Lord. <laughs> and then Hunter, keeping it real, is thankful for space rocks. <laughs> Age four. So there's so much we could be thankful for. I appreciate our kids. Let's give a round of applause. Helping us remember there, there is a lot. And... I'm the children's pastor here at Bethel and just uh, love my job. I love working with the, the youth and kids of our church. And it's been a difficult year for our kids. Uh, they've had a lot thrown at them. Um, this very well may be the most flexible and resilient generation in history 50 years from now. Um, everything that these kids have had thrown at them, the thing you don't hear when you're hanging out with kids, is complaints. They're just taking it and, and doing so well. And so I'm just so thankful for our kids. But I have to confess, our, we don't do so well as adults. <laughs> because a lot of the things I hear from adults are complaints. Uh, maybe you've said these phrases. This year is a bust. 2020 sucks. I can't wait until this year is over. Is 2020 cursed? I don't know if I believe in that, but after this year, I might. I don't know. Uh, this year has been very challenging. We think about 
COVID-19 pandemic, protests and unrest, uh, the fires here locally and all over the West Coast, um, the election, ooh, right? All, all of this that has been just thrown right at us, right? And we've had to deal with it. It's very easy for me to make thankfulness the last thing on my mind. Uh, it's so easy for me to latch on to reading an article about what's coming up next or reading something about this and centering and focusing on the negative and the difficulties in life instead of taking that repositioning and staying centered on God and focused on Him. Today, there are two truths that I want to bring out in one secret mission, which we're going to get to at the end. Uh, the first truth is, for many people all over our world, this year has sucked. I don't want to shock you. I don't say that to be shocking. Uh, and it is a word I would not use in kids' church. So, uh, This year has been the worst for so many. It makes giving Sunday, uh, Give Thanks Sunday really hard. Uh, but the truth is, to deny that would be a lie for so many people. It, it is true. This year has been very difficult. And giving thanks is not ignoring or putting up a blinder to what's going on in our world, okay? Giving thanks is in the midst of our darkest and hardest times, positioning ourselves to receive maximum grace and maximum mercy from the Lord by... Thank you for who you are. ...has given us and the things we can be thankful for. And, and the second is that same point. Uh, first truth, this year has kind of been a bummer. Second truth, God's still worthy of praise. Amen? God's still worthy of thanksgiving. And I know it seems like things are bad and maybe the worst ever, but kind of since the beginning, God's people have had trouble in this world. And if you've read much of the Bible, you'll see countless stories of extremely challenging times that God's people have been through and yet have been able to remain thankful and praising God for his goodness. Um, there were so many examples I could have chosen today, but the one that uh, centered on for me was David. Now, many of you may know of David, some of you may not. Um, you're thinking back, maybe you've heard the story of David and Goliath, this little guy who throws a stone and kills this giant and then cuts his head off and holds it up. No amens for that. We get a lot of amens for that in kids' church. So, again, let's learn from our kids. Um, but after, you know, that crazy story, David is supposed to become the next king of Israel. There's a big problem, though. Saul is already the king, and Saul decides he's going to try to kill David. And so David is forced to flee. And I want to read from Psalms 56. You can turn there or uh, flip there on your phone. Uh, but to give you the backdrop of this psalm, David writes this having fleed from Saul and then basically ends up in the town of Gath, which happens to be the hometown of Goliath. Not a great place for David to be. In fact, the Bible says this is from uh, 1 Samuel 21, that David was so scared of the king of Gath that he actually pretends to be insane and like mutters stuff and makes marks on the gates and just lets all of his drool go down his beard, which is wild, uh, but it's in the Bible. And so uh, David is in this very tough spot. There is no place for him. What he doesn't know, but is the truth, scholars, it's kind of hard to get the exact timing because the Bible doesn't list a lot of dates in this story, but D David's starting a seven-year journey where he is going to be living in caves running for his life every single day. This is the backdrop to which he wrote many of his psalms. And one of them, and we're going to start at uh, verse 8. It says this. I'm going to read the whole thing, then I'm going to come back and make a couple comments. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this, I will know that God is, God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you. 
For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. An impressive psalm here. Uh, David pointing out so many great things, uh, but what I want you to connect here is that David's life was pretty bad right now, but yet he's still saying, God, I'm going to bring my thanks to you. I'm going to praise you and your word. Um, So as we go back through it, what a great start here in verse 8. Record my misery. If you haven't prayed that prayer yet, uh, go through the Psalms because you might be able to pray that prayer. Uh, when, you're, when you're really low and you're feeling bad, again, our, our goal for Thanksgiving is not to ignore or minimize the pain going on in your life or try to ignore it. Um, and as you give advice to other people about giving thanks, try not to do that and minimize their pain or ignore what they're going through. Um, record my misery, but do you see how he redeems it here? List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? All of this is happening. And you, and you have to imagine, as I picture David at least, he's journeying from cave to cave, trying to find a way to stay alive for another week or day, and he's sobbing, crying in front of his men, just crying. In that moment, he repositions himself to say, you know what, every one of these tears is being recorded, God. And I know that you are with me, that you are going to pay back all that has been hurt, all the pain for your glory, Lord. And he gets and he writes it in there, you know, saying, are these not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. It's like when my kids are fighting and somebody goes too far and then there's tears. And then they invoke, Dad! You know that (laughs) the kid who caused the tears is running. Uh, It's this moment of like, then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I know that God is for me. You know, saying this, even though he's pursued and his enemies are not turning back, he's saying, I know you're going to save me, God. Thanking God for things that haven't even happened in his life yet. That is putting yourself in the place to receive maximum grace and mercy from the Lord. He's thanking God for the things that haven't even happened yet. And then I kind of love this verse because he has to say it twice as I'm reading it, almost like it's like, my life really sucks, so I'm going to say this twice to remind myself, in God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not afraid, what? Can man do to me? One takeaway you might take from today is simply that. A lot of the anxiety and the fear that we experience, we could, we could put under the cross with that one phrase, what can men do to me? If God is with me, who can be against me, right? We can be thankful that God is on our side. And he's with us. And what a blessing that is. David gets it. And, you know, as we know the story, he does eventually become king. And God spares his life through countless battles and and obstacles that he goes up against. But he, he confirms here, I am under vows to God, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you. Again, they're one of my favorite quotes. And most of you don't know this about me, but I am a runner. I know I don't look like it, but I do help coach at Crater High School, and I try to keep up with the slowest JV runners, and I can't. But I love it. One of my favorite running quotes is, uh, when you can get into the mindset that running is like brushing your teeth, the decision is already made. It's not a, not a question of if you're going to do it. The decision is already made. You're going to get up and you're going to run. I have not lived by that with running, but I have brushed my teeth. I brushed it this morning. But when we think about giving thanks to God, it's that same attitude you see here. I will present my thank offerings to you. The decision has already been made for David. It's not a matter of, well, God, this year kind of sucked. I don't know if I could praise you this time or, God, this really is hard for me right now. David's saying it doesn't matter. I know who you are. 
maybe not in totality, but I know you, Lord, for the little amount I know of you, I have to do this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to praise you and I give my thank offering to you. And then this last verse, we're going to come back to it, but I've got to read it. It says, For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. And what a beautiful statement. There's a couple of... Uh, key points that I want to take from the scripture. The first is David understood that difficulty in his life shouldn't change the frequency of his thanksgiving to God, right? That his circumstances, as difficult as they might be, should not be the factor that determines if he praises God or not, if he lifts up God or thanks him, right? And if you need a reminder from our kids, I have about a hundred more of these there is something to be thankful for, okay? It may be hard to find it, but there is something you can be thankful for. Um, I also want to point out, when faced with the choice to focus on the negative or the disappointments in David's life, uh, he was supposed to be the king right now. He was anointed king by Samuel, um, but he's not. In fact, he's left his home, left his family, and he's out you know, for a very long time now, living every day trying to fend for his life, he chooses to rest and focus on the Lord. When given the choice, he's positioned himself to receive maximum grace and mercy from the Lord, that he gets it, because it'd be so easy to miss with every circumstance in his life. It'd be so easy to focus on the negative things. I don't think David's ignored it at all. In fact, this Scripture in verse 8 starts with, record my miseries, Lord. They're real, and I get it, but I'm not going to focus on them. I'm going to focus on you, Lord. Now, the next point is, is another that I've kind of talked about a little bit, but the importance of giving thanks, and I want to make sure we get this, it's not a psychological state in which we convince ourselves that bad stuff is not really happening. You're not tricking yourself to think positive uh, like a meme might say, or somebody might remind you on Facebook, like, that is not what giving thanks is about. It's not about denying the way the world is. It's not about tricking yourself into being positive, um, but it is a spiritual discipline that grounds you in the peace that comes only from Jesus, right? So one of the uh, key words there is grounds, uh, my wife, who is a crisis counselor for Jackson County Mental Health, uh, one of the things that she does when people are uh, at their crisis is she does some grounding techniques. And these are weird, but also very effective. One of them is simply to trace your hand with your finger, reminding yourself that you exist, that you're here you're feeling this. Those thoughts in your brain, when you start thinking of these grounding things, they silence some of those voices of you are the worst and you know, you'll know you have no value, right? They can quiet those down to the point that then you can function and try to make some healthy decisions to get out of your crisis. Thanksgiving is that for the Christian. When we can position ourselves, it grounds us to say, wait a minute. I forgot that God is God. Like, here I was focusing on the craziness when I should have been focusing on Jesus and letting my thanksgiving to him ground me into peace. Uh, and that, that is important. Um, the last thing I want to say here, as we kind of read from a lot of David's Psalms, he's not uh, void of negative. He definitely recognizes it and mentions it. But I want you to be mindful of what you say mindful of what you think. When you talk, how much complaining do you do? Uh, how, how negative are you right now? And I am talking to you, duck fan. That's right. I don't know, Barry. Sometimes the beavers win. For once in a while. Once a decade. <laughs> yeah, baby! I'm a, I'm a beaver fan. Um... It doesn't happen often. We might lose every game for the rest of the season, but it doesn't matter at this point. Uh, go Beavs. But truthfully, the words you say, 
have a great impact, or, or should I say the words you post have a great impact? Are you speaking life? I cannot read this psalm and not see David just screaming life at us. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. Speak life to your coworkers. Speak life to your friends and family. Please, if you get nothing else, get this. Speak life to yourself and the things that you say in your own mind about yourself. You have value. You're important. You are literally God's beloved. He loves you. He went to the cross for you. Um, stop beating yourself up. Receive that. Position yourself to be thankful to God. Now, I know this year has been difficult, but don't center your life around the craziness of the world. Center your life around Jesus. Allow him to be the central focus. Uh, not to ignore what's happening, but to bring your thoughts anchored and back to how much God loves you, how much God loves this world, and all of the great things that he's doing. When I feel far from Jesus, I know it's not because he's left me, Thanksgiving is one of the ways I get back to him. It positions me to receive from the Lord again. When I'm saying, God, I'm thankful you died on the cross for my sins, right? I'm thankful for my family. God, I'm thankful for the shoes that you've given me on my feet. God, I'm thankful for my breath right now as I breathe. And then to go through the list to position yourself in that way. So, two truths. This year has been a kind of a bummer. Uh, and that is true. First, for most, not for everybody. Also, equally true, in fact, way more true. Uh, it doesn't mean we should stop praising and thanking the Lord, right? Our circumstances shouldn't dictate how we, how we praise Jesus. We can raise, even in the greatest storm, we can raise our hands to the Lord and love him. Uh, I want to invite the worship team to come back up, and I want to talk about my secret mission for you. There's one other piece. Uh, that secret mission is simply this. I want you to be ready for Christmas. Be ready for Christmas. Now, 2020 has given us plenty to think about and obsess about, but, and I'm not, a prof I'm not making a prophecy, all right? Kayla, this is not a prophetic word. But what I am saying is, I kind of think there's going to be more bad stuff. Like, it just seems that's the way it's been, right? It, there's going to be even more for us to be crazy about. And maybe it's very personal for you, something in your family. Uh, there will be plenty of reasons to think about the craziness in our world. What are you going to post about? What are you going to be reading? What articles are you going to be drawn to? Are you going to be drawn to the craziness or are you going to be drawn to Jesus? Where is your focus going to be, right? Where is your mind going to be at? One, one of my favorite movies, it's never... Grinch Stole Christmas. If you haven't seen it, it's great. Uh, the Grinch tries to steal Christmas from Whoville and despite everything he does, all the attempts, the best plan he can make, he can't stop Christmas from coming, right? It's because the people of Whoville knew it wasn't the amount of decorations or toys or whatever they had. They had each other. And they were going to worship the Lord, right? And that was what Christmas was all about. Now, I'm going to get extended here a little bit. We may have some Grinches in our own life. Uh, maybe for you, that's COVID-19, or the presidential election, or Governor Brown, or your family. There might be plenty of things trying to suck the joy out of Christmas this year for you. But in the end, the Grinch had zero power to do that. It was the Hoos who had the power. If anyone is going to ruin Christmas this year, it's going to be you. <laughs> and I don't say that 
to beat you up. I say that to say, prepare yourself. Be ready. We don't know what the rest of the year is going to have, but I do know I have a Savior worth worshiping and being thankful for. It's our secret mission this year to be thankful to God no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Today is a special day. It's the beginning of Advent. Advent is one of our most uh, ancient traditions in the church. It started around the 5th century. And it's basically a four-week anticipation of the coming of Christ. Today, in this whole week, we focus on the hope that Jesus brings. I don't know how David knew it, and it was, I think, very literal for him, but these words ring so much differently for me when I read them. For you have delivered me from death, my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. That's what Jesus did. He came to bring light in the darkest situation. Even though it had been 400 years since we have any recording of God speaking through a prophet, even though the people were being oppressed by Rome, this place where Jesus was born, even though the nation of Israel was fracturing into the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots and all these different groups, even though there was governmental control and they tried to make a census and force everybody to go to a place to celebrate the holidays, right? Even though Jesus and his family were probably very poor because there was a huge gap in between the very rich and the very poor. Even though Herod, the king of all, was trying to kill Jesus and not allow his birth to happen. This is the backdrop that God said, I'm going to come. I'm going to bring light to those who need it most. Most. 